right. Well, you look at this graphic and you think, hey, what, what's going on here? I thought we were supposed to go on into First Kings. And um, I think we got some unfinished business to do here in Second Samuel first. And so we'll get into, we'll get into First Kings uh, next time we get together. But there's a subject that I want to deal with. And I, and I said as we were making our way through Second Kings that we would deal with it. And then I I got to the end of 2 Samuel, hey, we haven't dealt with that. We've got some unfinished business, and that unfinished business is this guy, Joab. So I want to do something just a little bit different tonight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of have you flip to a few different portions of Scripture. I normally don't like doing that. I, I hate in a, being in a Bible study, and you're just flipping all over the place. It just drives me crazy. I like to get just one place and stay there. But because of this subject matter... It's going to require us to do a little bit of moving. And I want to begin in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 11. Now, you remember that, that Joab uh, was the captain of uh, the, the army of Israel. Uh, Joab was a terminator. He was a killer. Uh, Joab was a guy that you just did not want to mess with. And you remember that when we were in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, that that David was giving out accolades to the men that had contributed to his greatness. And he listed there what he called his mighty men. Now, God, God put him on the throne. God kept him on the throne. But God used human agents. And there in chapter 23, David is paying tribute to these guys that put their life on the line to see to it that he was able to ascend to the throne and to hold on to the throne. And as he's listing now all of these mighty men, you go down through that list, there is one name that is missing from that list, and it is Joab. And you would, you would ask yourself, well, how, how is it that Joab, the captain of all of the guys, this, this killer, this mighty warrior, how is it that Joab doesn't make the list? Now, what's interesting is that two of Joab's brothers and Joab's armor bearer make the list. So three guys associated with Joab make the list, but Joab himself doesn't make the list. What Joab represents is, is really what, what I would think of as wasted potential. I think that wasted potential is one of the most painful experiences in, in life. Uh, you know, you've got, a, you've got your favorite sports team. They're ranked number one in the nation. They've gone undefeated uh, throughout the regular season, and they go into the tournament. And wouldn't you know, playing an unranked team, they get knocked off in the first round of, of the tournament. You think, just, oh, man, what wasted potential, man. We were set up to just go through this undefeated season, and look at what's happened to us. Well, here is this man. Joab, with all of the natural giftedness of a warrior, and yet he doesn't make the list. So we have to ask ourselves why. Because I believe that our heavenly David has a list. I believe that our heavenly David has a list of those who are going to be greatly rewarded in the age to come. On that list are those that he will say to them, well done, thou good and perfect servant. I, I want to be on that list. I'm sure you would like to be on that list as well. And what we find in Joab is a number of things that kept him off of the list. And these things are the same dangers that you and I face. And so so here, here is Joab, a guy that should have been on the list. He's not on the list. Now remember, why was the Old Testament written? The Old Testament was written to, uh, you know, to help us, right, teach us that, that it instructs us on what not to do and what not to be. And as we study the life of Joab, we're going to see what were the things that took this great man down. And I think that it helps us to understand where did this guy start? Where did, where did it all begin? And this is what we have here in uh, chapter 11 of First Chronicles in verse 6. Now, the background, the backstory to this verse is that you remember that David, he's become king and 
on, on the list of things to do. The very first thing that David does is that he goes after Jerusalem. Jerusalem is still being held by the Jebusites. And the Jebusites have found such a wonderful fortress in Jerusalem that they begin to mock David. They begin to make fun of David. They begin to suggest to David that they could bring up uh, people who were blind, people who were not equipped to fight, and, and he could place, they could place them on the wall and they would be able to hold the forces of David back. And they begin to make fun of David. And David makes an emotional decision and I'm sure that all of us, we've made emotional decisions and much of the time those emotional decisions were the wrong decisions. Now, I'm sure that David had a lot of regrets and no doubt verse six is one of those regrets. Notice what David says as he's being mocked by the Jebusites. He says, now David said, whoever attacks the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. And Joab, the son of Zariah, went up first and became chief. Now, I'm sure that as David reflected on his life, he, he realized there were boneheaded decisions that he made. No doubt chief, chief among them would have been the Bathsheba affair, right? All of, us, all of us have regrets. All of us wish we could go back and redo some things. I think David had three major regrets in his life. Bathsheba was number one. Number two, no doubt, was what we covered last time we were given in chapter 24, the numbering of the people. That was a big regret. But running a close third was no doubt this decision here. Now think about what David was offering. He's looking at an impregnable fortress. And he says to his men, hey, one of you guys, I don't care which one, one of you guys, whoever gets up there climbs over that wall, gets to the front door and unlocks it so the rest of us can get in and take care of business. Whoever has the hair to do that, I'm going to make him chief. I'm going to put him over the whole military. And we read here, notice who that was. It was Joab. Now, what was he, what was he offering? He's offering the leadership of the military to a non-thinking nut, right? I mean, who, who is going to scale the wall of an impregnable fortress, right? Climb over the top of the wall, fight his way to the front door, and open it up for the rest of the guys. Who's going to do that but some crazy person? And that's exactly who Joab was. Understand that David was not putting a West Point graduate over his military, but he was getting this nut job who now is in a position that he really doesn't have the skill set for. Now, Joab was certainly the tip of the spear, but he had no business managing that spear. He didn't have the people skills necessary he didn't have the character necessary. And so what we first see in this man is that he ends up in a position that he has no business being in. It is vitally important that you and I, wherever we find ourselves in life and where, whatever we find ourselves involved in, that we can say with some degree of confidence, what I am doing and what I am about and, and what I am accomplishing in life is because I'm where God wants me to be. There is some sort of an understanding that, that what I'm doing, what I am involved in, is a call from God himself. This is a man who has called himself to that position. And the problem with calling yourself to that position is that when you call yourself, now you gotta keep yourself. You see, if you're called by God, well, God's got to keep you. If God has given you a position, well, then only God can remove that, that from your life. If man gives you the position, then man can take that position away. And so here's a guy who has called himself to this position, and now he has to prove himself. Now, let's jump back to 2 Samuel chapter 2, and let's look at what else trans, transpires in this guy's life. I want to draw your attention, chapter 2, to verse 27. Now, the scene is, is that David, David is, is new to the throne. 
Here we have Joab. He is the general over the Judean army. But remember that the house of Saul is, is still, claiming, uh, still claiming the throne. And the house of Saul has, as their military general, a guy by the name of Abner. And Abner has thrown his weight behind Saul's loser of a son. And Abner is going to discover that, that Saul's son was a loser. But these two generals have a face-to-face. They, somebody set up this meeting. Hey, let's talk. Let's see if we can, we can come to some common ground here. And so as these two generals are meeting, uh, they, there's a skirmish that breaks out between the two sides. And so there's a few guys that are killed. Now it's starting to get a little, a little intense. And they start going at each other. And it's interesting that Abner's forces begin to get the short end of the deal. And so Joab's forces begin to chase Abner's forces. And Joab has a a young brother. And the young brother sees an opportunity to put a feather in his cap if he can take out Abner himself. And so the young brother sees the direction that Abner is running in. And so Joab's young brother goes after Abner. And Abner looks back and says, hey, go away, all right? You, You come for a bear. You better be ready to kill a bear or to get into a fight with a bear. I don't think, young guy, you quite know what you're tangling with. Go home. I don't want to offend Joab. But the young brother would not listen. And finally, Abner stops, takes on this young, ambitious guy and kills him. And then he takes off running. And now Joab and his guys catch up and he sees his young brother dead. And now this guy is filled with fury. And this guy takes off after Abner. Now Abner positions himself in a well-defensible position. And having the high ground, he yells out at Joab. And he says to Joab, what are we doing? Right, we're family. We all belong to the same dad. We're all the the sons of Abraham, for crying out loud. What are we doing to each other? This is craziness that that we're, we're fighting and killing each other. And notice how Joab responds in verse 27. Joab said, as God lives, unless you had spoken, surely then by morning all of the people would have given up pursuit of their brethren. God only knows what would have happened had you not spoken. Isn't it interesting that it took another voice to talk him back off of the ledge? What Joab is saying, we would have chased you all night. We would not have stopped. This is a guy who clearly has no control over his behavior. This is a guy who once he's decided that he's going to set off into a direction that there there's nobody that's that's going to turn him away from that. And so what we have here, we've got an interesting mixture, don't we? We've we've got this guy where there's just there's this false pride going on, there's the absence of self-control uh in in his life. And again, This is part of the problem when a guy is in a position where he is in way over his head. Because when a man knows that he is in over his head, what does he have to do? He's got to prove himself, right? I have to to prove that I deserve to be in this position that I'm in. And what happens? That man becomes a tyrant. And he uses this tyranny to, to prove that he is in a position that, that he deserves. And, and you've, you've seen tyrants in the workplace. You've seen tyrants in the pulpit. You've seen tyrants in church leadership where they know they don't belong there, but they find themselves there and they like there. They like the position that they have. And so they begin to be, they have to become really jerks uh, to hold on to that position. And so he says, they're all right. All right, you will we'll back off. But it took somebody else. So, so here, here we've got, we've got Joab. There's zero security. And again, you compare him with David. God gave David the throne. David behaves in a way that he understands only God's going to take the throne uh, away from him. There's zero insecurity in the life of David because David knew he was where he was supposed to be because God put him there. 
And so then notice in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, we find a, a, another interesting thing that happens with this guy. Now, again, Abner, Abner has um, uh, realized that he's put his money on the wrong pony. Abner realizes that the son of, of Saul is an idiot. And so Abner uh, comes to David and he says to David, um, I, I, I wanna support you and I will bring uh, my military over. I'll use my influence to win them over. You can win this civil war without even uh, firing a shot. And so he leaves and they, he cuts a deal with David and he leaves and then, of course, Joab uh, shows up and he realizes that his competition has just made a deal with his king. Well, that, that doesn't go over uh, very well. And so notice now in verse 27 of chapter 3 that, that Abner returns and notice that Joab took him uh, aside in the, in the gate to speak unto him privately. And there... He stabbed him in the stomach, and so he died for the blood of Asashel, that would be his younger brother. Here's a man who is so filled with unforgiveness that he is willing um, to kill an innocent and an honorable man. So we get the picture of this man. He's, he's, he's in a position that he's called himself to, there's no self-control. Somebody else has to talk him back off of the ledge. And now we find that unforgiveness has a stronghold in his heart. Vodi Bakum, he says this about unforgiveness. He said, if we refuse to forgive, we've stepped into dangerous waters. First, refusing to forgive is to put ourselves in the place of God as though vengeance were our prerogative and not his. Second, unforgiveness says God's wrath is insufficient. For the unbeliever, we're saying that an eternity in hell is not enough. They need our slap in the face or cold shoulder to even the scales of justice. For the believer, we're saying that Christ's humiliation and death are not enough. In other words, we shake our fist at God and say, your standards may have been satisfied, but my standard is higher. And so here's a man who is committed to destroy all of those who have offended him. He's in a position he doesn't belong. He, of course, is, is lacking self-control, and he will get his vengeance no matter what. Now, notice in um, chapter 10 now, there's something else that happens with this guy. And, uh, and we read in chapter 10, now, Again, David has been offended by the Ammonites. He sends Joab and his brother uh, against, and the military against the Ammonites. And what happens is, is that uh, Joab walks into an ambush. Uh, the Ammonites have hired the Syrians. He is assuming that all of the Ammonites are holed up in their capital city. He's approaching the capital city, and all of a sudden he becomes aware that to his rear is you've got the crazy Syrians. And the crazy Syrians are now beginning uh, to march his way. So understand the gravity of this situation, right? You, you're, you've walked into a trap. You got Ammonites in front of you. You got Syrians behind you. Now notice what this guy does. So he, he divides the troops. He divides the troops in half. He puts his brother in charge of one half and he puts himself in charge of the other half. He says, me and my guys, we're gonna go after the Syrians. You and your guys go after the Ammonites. But then he says this. He says, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage. And let, let us be strong for our people, for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what is good in his sight. Now you get the feeling when you study this man's life that he really didn't have much of a devotional life. You get the feeling that he really didn't experience any kind of nearness to God. 
you kind of get the feeling that he's just one of these guys that would find himself in a worship service, just constantly looking at his watch. How long is this dumb thing going to go? When in the world will this be over with? So that we can get to the real issues of life. This is a man that doesn't understand worship. This is a man that doesn't understand uh, devotion to God. Look at, look at what, what, what's going on here. Now, I would think if there was ever a time to drop to your knees and pray like you've never prayed before, it's when you got Ammonites in front of you and Syrians behind you. But you look at this, and notice now there's, there's no words of faith here. Notice he seems to be saying, all right, now, come on. Let's give it the old college try, all right? Let's get out there. Let's put our nose to the grindstone, and let's get this deal uh, done, and God is going to be doing whatever it is that God is going to do. There's, there's no words of, of faith here. Uh, there's no uh, dependency, really, uh, upon God at all. And, and this, this is, a, this is a, a strong man, this is a man who's used to fighting his own battles. Um, th this, is a, this is a self-made man. This is a guy that just believes you just pull yourself up by the bootstraps no matter what's coming your way, and you're going to be able to take on uh, this world. And so he says to his brother, all right, let's not mess around. Let's take care of business here and wipe these guys wipe these guys out. Now, you'll notice then in uh, the next chapter, we have him killing Uriah, and uh, he played his role in that, but he kills, he kills somebody else. Let's, let's turn back to chapter 18, and let's notice what happens here. Now, you remember the backstory to this is that um, Joab is fighting Absalom, who was the son of David. David's own son is bringing about uh, this, this military coup. And David, before the battle starts, David makes his will very clear. David says to his three generals, including Joab here, and he says to all of his men, from top to the bottom, the entire military understands David does not want his son harmed in any way. Well, as the battle is engaged, you remember that his, his son Absalom gets tangled up by his hair in this tree, and, he, and he's, he's knocked off of this mule, and he's left, he's left hanging there by his hair. And one of the soldiers sees it and comes to Joab and says, hey, Absalom's over here hanging, hanging from a tree. And Joab says, well, did you kill him? And he said, well, no. I mean, you heard what the boss said. He doesn't want anybody messing with his son. And Joab is just filled with disgust. And notice in verse 4 of chapter 18, and then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. Get away from me. And he took three spears in his hand, and he thrust them through Absalom's heart. And while he was still alive in the midst of the Terbinith tree. Now, this is a man who would say, who would no doubt think of himself that he is loyal to David, right? And being loyal to David meant that he had one job. And that one job was to keep David on the throne. I think this is an example of a, of a man who, who is being loyal to David but he didn't really love David. And in many ways, his loyalty was self-serving because as long as David was on the throne, that Joab was, well, he's going to be general, right? Now, if there's a new administration that comes along, well, maybe he's not going to be general. So keeping David on the throne was ultimately benefiting Joab. Joab was loyal, but Joab did not love. And how many people are there in the world today that they are loyal to their religious organization, they're loyal to their religion, but they don't know anything about love for their heavenly David. Now, no doubt, Joab is thinking to himself, David is allowing the emotion of family to cloud his vision. And no doubt, he's thinking that it takes a cold, calculating killer like himself to cut through the fog of that emotion and do what is right 
for the nation, what is right for the king. You see, he didn't really understand the heart of the king as well. Well, no doubt David figures out what happened to his son. And so you remember he replaced, he replaced Joab with Amasa. Now that doesn't go over well, as you can well imagine. And so turn over just a couple of chapters to chapter 20. And so uh, Joab now is greeting Amasa in verse 9. And we read, and Joab said to Amasa, are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard. Now, that would be very similar to you and I sticking out our hand to shake hands, uh, for, another, for one man to grab another man's beard and to draw them near. It was a sign that they were going to kiss you on the cheek. It was a warm uh, Mideastern welcome. And so Amasa has his guard down. He doesn't have his hand, you know, on his weapon. He, he believes this man is giving him a genuine, uh, you know, loving greeting, if you will. Are you in health, my brother? He took, he took his beard in his right hand to kiss him. And, uh, but Amasa did not notice uh, the sword that was in uh, Joab's hand. And he struck him uh, in the stomach. And his entrails, they poured out on the ground. Very gruesome scene. And he did not strike him again. And thus he died. And Joab and Abishai, his brother, they then went on in their pursuit of Sheba, uh, the son of, of Bishri. And so, you know, all, all of this now is, is coming back because he's just in this, he's in a position that he doesn't really deserve. And again, you, you see this happening uh, all, all the time. He doesn't perceive what David's heart is. He doesn't understand what a curse he is really being. He doesn't he doesn't really understand the devastation that he's bringing upon. This is, this is a man, and, and you'll, see this, you'll see this in people, where the whole thing is the mission. Everything is the mission. What is most important is that we finish the mission. And they put mission over relationships. They put mission over the, over the value of, of human life. Look at, look at what we're seeing. For example, in the Catholic Church, as they're just shuffling all of these perverted priests from place to place, and they're trying to sweep all of this sexual abuse that's going on. What is that? That's a bunch of Joabs. It's a bunch of men that see that the mission is the most important thing. When church leaders sweep sin that's in the leadership just under the rug and trying to keep it out of sight, it's the very same thing. It's all about us completing the mission, and the mission is for this organization to be seen in the community as being a success. The mission is that we finish what it is that we believe that God has called us to. But what has God called us to? To love him and to love others. And if we're going to love him and we're going to love others, it means that we put relationship over whatever kind of weird mission statement we're coming up with as a religious organization. Anytime you begin to put mission over relationship, you are beginning to walk down that path of Joab. So Joab, he really doesn't understand David. And if he would have understood David, it would have kept him from his final and fatal mistake. Now we'll get to this in a, a couple of weeks, but we read it tonight. Turn back to uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 2. And here in 1 Kings chapter 2, the backstory of all of this is that David, David is in his final moments of life. He's giving his final words to Solomon. Uh, Solomon is taking over the throne, and David is giving him a list of things uh, to do. And notice what he says, beginning in verse 5. Moreover, you know what Joab, the son of Zeruiah. Now, remember, Joab would have been Solomon's cousin. And Zeruiah was his aunt, David's sister. So, you know your cousin Joab, your aunt Zeruiah's, uh, you know, son, right? You, you know what he did to me. And, and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel. I am telling you, 
You walk the path of Joab. It looks like you're winning for a period of time, but it is going to come back and bite you. You don't get away with anything. There is an immutable law in this universe of reaping and sowing. And whatever you sow, you will reap. And if you are like Joab, where you destroy people, it's only a matter of time for you're going to end up being destroyed. You know what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel? To, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, who he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime. And he put blood, the blood of war on his belt around his waist and on his center. He's a guy that's covered with blood down to his feet. Now, therefore, do according to your way. Now, I love this. Now, you kind of do what you think's right. Wink, wink, nod, nod. And do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. And as we will study in 1 Kings, that he certainly, that is Solomon, he certainly took care of Joab in a very brutal way. You and I, we don't need to worry about balancing the scales. God is quite able at balancing those scales. The Lord is just. And that person that you think is getting away with something, they're not getting away with anything at all. And really, if we have the heart of Christ, we're going to pray for that person because what they have waiting for them in outer darkness is absolute horror. And if we have the heart of Jesus, we're going to be praying for the salvation of that person and not praying that they would get what they would deserve. Now let's look at Joab's path, shall we? He's not satisfied with what God has given. He takes it for himself. He's going to take the position. I want that position. I want to rule, and I'm going to take it. He's lacking self-control. There's no ruling authority in his life. He's, he's an authority to himself. He's a law to himself. He's, he's going to make up his own morality, He's being controlled by unforgiveness. He was one guy you would not want to cross. He lacks a devotional life, and that's where so much of that comes from. He just doesn't know God. He doesn't know God's ways, and so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that he doesn't walk in God's ways. And, of course, he really lacks love for his David, and we have to be careful that we don't lack love for our heavenly David. These things were written for our learning. And so the, 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 the story that we see in Joab is that this is how a great man does not become a mighty man. Haven't you seen people? They seem to be so gifted they seem to be so talented. They seem to be set up to make just such a fabulous mark for the kingdom of God in this world. And they just, they just kind of fizzle out. And their life really doesn't even come close to what you think that it should have been. And it very well could have been that they too were just walking this path of Joab. The path of success in the kingdom of God is a path of great humility. To become great, you need the grace of God. Where do we get the grace of God? Who does God give grace to? He gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Oh, I think as we go to prayer tonight, we should be praying, Lord, help me to walk humbly before you. Help me to find myself in the very place that you have carved out for me. Oh, Lord, help me to be spirit-controlled. Lord, give me the grace to forgive. Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you as the Apostle Paul cried out as his great prayer. Oh, to know him. And I don't want to fall behind in my love for you. Help me, Lord, to love you. And man, if that prayer request is answered in our life, you're going to be great in the kingdom of God. And you're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant.
Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jed and his heart. Lord, what a wonderful, faithful servant he is. And I pray that you'll continue just to have your hand of blessing upon him and that ministry over there. We do pray for their elections, Lord, that you would allow the righteous to ascend to power, that the people would be blessed. Lord, you tell us in your word that sin is a reproach to any people, but where the righteous rule, well, there's blessing. And so I pray that the righteous would rule there in Georgia. We certainly want to pray for our elections too, Father. What a mess we find ourselves in. I pray that your people would have a burden to have their voices heard before perhaps our voices are taken away. Lord, help us to be passionate about our nation. Lord, help us to be people of prayer and people of faith. Lord, as we looked at this man, Joab, oh Lord, keep that mess far from us. Lord, may we learn not to be a Joab. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.